Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending my talk, Guarding Against Protocol Subversion at Coinbase. One second. Hmm. Sorry about this. My name is Mark Nesbitt, and I'm an application security engineer at Coinbase. Coinbase is a digital, digital currency wallet and platform where merchants and consumers can transact with new digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Some of my recent priorities have been security support for systems that integrate with cryptocurrency networks and also security assessments and mitigations for assets that Coinbase supports. My talk is going to have two main parts. First, what does proto protocol subversion mean? And second, two live real examples of attacks that we caught in the wild. The first is a 51% double spend attack, and the second are ERC-20 administrative privilege takeover. So first, what does protocol subversion mean? Most everyone here is likely already familiar with the CIA framework for security. C for confidentiality, I for integrity, and A for availability. Examining a system for these three properties gives a great start into understanding the security and threats against the system. I'll describe how cryptocurrencies work in a bit more detail, but for the time being, it's important to realize that a cryptocurrency is a network of nodes that communicate to one another according to a protocol. The nodes on the network store a copy of the blockchain, which is a public shared database, and the network protocol allows nodes to communicate state information about the blockchain. Nearly every blockchain has an authorization model based on public key cryptography. The state of data in the blockchain can usually only be updated when the proper digital signature is provided. An example of this would be sending bitcoins from one person to another. The sender must authorize this transaction, which is a blockchain state change, by signing this send. A wallet is an example of software that is built on top of a blockchain. Wallets hold private keys and can submit transactions to the blockchain. As you could probably imagine, because the blockchain is a shared public database, anyone can choose to build a wallet application on top of a blockchain. We'll take a quick look at the CIA for wallet applications. Confidentiality, a loss of private keys, is a, is a violation of confidentiality that you often hear about in the media when you hear about hacks in the cryptocurrency space. If the private keys held in the wallet are leaked, Anyone can authorize transactions for actions controlled by those keys. Integrity, manipulating the recipient of a transaction. Another interesting wallet failure mode. If an attacker can manipulate the recipient of a transaction prior to that transaction being signed, there's no need for the attacker to have access to the private keys. A large component of my day-to-day -day work is ensuring confidentiality and integrity in our wallet systems. Much of this is traditional security architecture and back-end security engineering work. For completeness, I've also given two examples of availability failure that you might have heard about. Both of these, um, forgetting the encryption password and not backing up the hard drive, will result in a loss of keys. It's not really an attack vector, as the attacker doesn't gain control of these funds, but they are availability and therefore security failures. This talk is about subversion of protocols, not wallets. So let's apply the CIA method to the blockchain itself. Confidentiality, it doesn't exist. I define the blockchain as a shared database. Thus, it's entirely transparent and there is no confidentiality. Jumping to availability, this is not a huge concern for anyone except for the protocol designers. Concerns about the availability of blockchains have driven much of what's known as the scaling debate in cryptocurrencies. If protocol design makes the resources required to run a network node too expensive, it may impact the availability of the blockchain information, which could have many negative impacts on the network. After all, everyone needs access to this data, and if it isn't available, it's kind of a deal breaker. Violations of the integrity of a blockchain is what I mean when I say protocol subversion. The integrity of the blockchain has recently become a bigger focus across the industry. As I said before, the blockchain contains shared public data and is often called unhackable in popular media descriptions. Whether or not you're a blockchain expert, I think nearly anyone in the room in a security conference can laugh a little bit at the word unhackable. Just like every other system, a blockchain has certain properties to it and I'm going to spend time describing ways blockchains and cryptocurrencies can have their in integrity attacked. As I mentioned before, I work for Coinbase, a major cryptocurrency exchange. Exchanges make an ideal target for all kinds of attacks, including and especially protocol subversion. 
You may not recognize this guy, but you've probably heard an apocryphal story about him. This is Slick Willie Sutton, a bank robber, and when asked, why do you rob banks? He replied, that's where the cryptocurrency is. I think that's how the story goes anyway. Exchanges hold a lot of cryptocurrency on behalf of their customers. That's an obvious enough reason, obvious enough reason for them to be good targets. Slick Willie hit the nail on the head with that. But beyond simply being where the money is, there are a lot of other characteristics of an exchange that are attractive to an attacker. Liquidity and volume. Being able to trade one currency into a different currency can be very advantageous to an attacker. Speed. Exchanges often credit funds to deposit to, to anyone depositing on the exchange in a relatively short time frame and allow for nearly instant sends. An attack could therefore happen very quickly. The ability to get in and out fast is obviously a good thing for an attacker. Remote interaction. An attacker can execute an attack from across the ocean, maybe even from North Korea. And lastly, in some cases, anonymity. I want to take a second to talk about this. Many popular media descriptions of cryptocurrency seem to ascribe it with some quasi-magical anonymity, which it doesn't have. This is especially true if you have an authenticated session with an exchange such as Coinbase. Coinbase strives to be the most trusted exchange in the entire cryptocurrency industry. As part of that, we are heavily regulated. And a large part of that regulation involves the lengths we go to ensure that every customer on our platform has gone through a rigorous KYC AML process. KYC, know your customer, so that means knowing their identities. This is important for AML, anti-money laundering. Any exchange that doesn't have these strict requirements would obviously be more attractive to potential attackers. So I'm going to talk about two major examples of protocol subversion. The first, 51% double spend attacks. As I mentioned before, a blockchain is a shared database, stored by all nodes on the network and accessible to anyone. For this database to be useful, there must be a way to update it. Blockchains are append-only databases and are updated in batches of transactions. Each batch of transactions that is added to the blockchain is known as a block. So we could visualize the blockchain as above, with block n being the most recently added block on down n minus 1 to the very first block. We could expect that a block n plus 1 would shortly be added. But who defines this block? The database is shared, it's distributed, so there must be some way of reaching consensus among the network participants about what constitutes the block. The answer is that it depends on the cryptocurrency. This is one of the major defining characteristics of different cryptocurrencies, and a lot of newer cryptocurrencies have innovative methods for adding to the blockchain. Ripple and Stellar have validator nodes which use a voting consensus protocol to determine which transactions will be in the next block. EOS has regularly elected nodes known as block producers, and they define the block. Tezos and Cardano work with proof of stake, where a node is chosen based on the proportion of the network funds that it controls, which is known as its stake. And lastly, the ones people are most familiar with, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the node that first successfully solves a cryptographic puzzle defines the block. This is known as proof of work. It's known as proof of work because the solution to this cryptographic puzzle has to be brute forced, which takes considerable computational effort. This is called mining. Mining a block is when a node discovers the solution to the proof of work puzzle. If there are ever any competing versions of the blockchain, these competitions are resolved by deeming the version with the most accumulated work to be the canonical blockchain. I'll explain what I mean by that. This diagram shows the blockchain tilted 90 degrees with the blocks separated. Block n plus 1 will be added on top of the other blocks. As before, each block contains some number of transactions. The green arrow indicates the canonical blockchain. Suppose some node solves the cryptographic puzzle. It broadcasts the block that solves that puzzle to the network, and all the transactions in the block are added to the canonical history of transactions, that is, to the blockchain. But suppose a second block is found simultaneously by another node. How do we decide which block contains the transactions that are to be added to the rule is that the nodes on the network define the series of blocks with the most, most work as the canonical history. So if either of those two blocks gets another block extending on top of it, there will be more accumulated work on that branch, which makes it the canonical blockchain. The other block is not added. This rule means that there's never a case where a block is truly finalized in the chain. If enough work decides to extend from a different block, once that branch has outworked the rest of the chain, it will be the canonical history. This situation on the slide is called a reorg, short for reorganization, and the grayed out blocks are known as orphaned blocks. Let me repeat a key fact. Any actor that can outwork the rest of the network is the sole arbiter 
of which among all possible valid transactions are the ones that are actually added to the history. So if there were some kind of network instability where blocks were not always immediately shared with the network after they were found, or if some actor was deliberately holding back blocks they, that had, they had discovered, we could see something like this, where the blocks on the left are hidden, but if they are shared with the network, the network will switch over to these blocks as the canonical chain because they have more accumulated work, orphaning the blocks that were previously the most recent additions to the chain. Because of this potential for instability in the most recent blocks, anyone receiving a transaction should wait for several blocks to be found after the block that contained the transaction to lower the chance that the block containing their transaction will wind up being orphaned. An analogy that I found interesting is that the most recent blocks are like, are like fallen leaves in the fall. They can blow around and change and shift. After a while, they might get waterlogged and don't move nearly as much, and even longer they decompose into mud, and after a while they become soil and potentially eventually sedimentary rock. You can adjust your risk by adjusting the number of blocks that you wait until you consider the transaction finalized. This is known as the confirmation requirement, and each recipient of a transaction decides for themselves what they want their confirmation requirement to be. So imagine we had the following situation where Coinbase supports a fictional coin, McCoin, abbreviated MUH. Suppose the confirmation requirement for MUH is three blocks. Coinbase also supports Bitcoin, BTC, and MUH trading. Any customer of Coinbase could have the following intention. Create a transaction T that sends a coin, the coin from the customer's wallet to Coinbase. Wait for three blocks, after which the confirmation limit is achieved, and Coinbase will credit the funds from transaction T to the customer's Coinbase account. The customer can then sell the MUH for BTC and send the BTC wherever they like. This is a completely normal pattern of behavior for a customer to take. Let's imagine, however, that this customer is actually an attacker, an attacker with the ability to outwork the entire rest of the MUH network. The attacker will create transaction T, sending some amount of McCoin onto Coinbase. Suppose T is quickly included in a block by some miner on the network. Simultaneously, the attacker will create T prime, a second transaction. Notice that T prime sends the same funds that were sent in T, funds from address A1. T and T prime could never exist in the same blockchain together. As soon as one is included, the other would be an invalid transaction because the money had already been spent. However, the attacker is mining T prime in secret. Remember, we've assumed that the attacker can outwork the rest of the network, meaning the attacker can produce blocks faster than the rest of the network. In order to do anything with the MUH on Coinbase, it first needs to have three confirmations. The attacker does not sit idly by and continues to secretly produce blocks. The network also produces blocks, but unknown to anyone, is not keeping pace with the secret blocks produced by the attacker. Now there are two, two confirmations for transaction T. Three confirmations are reached. The attacker is now credited with the MUH and can sell it for BTC, which could then be sent off the Coinbase platform. So the BTC has left. It's off the Coinbase platform. It's in the attacker's control. Remember, nothing seen publicly thus far is anything out of the ordinary. However, if the attacker reveals secret mining activity by broadcasting blocks to the network, the blocks have more accumulated work than the existing top three blocks. So a reorg will occur with the attacker's blocks now representing the canonical chain. The top three blocks that were previously seen publicly now become orphan blocks. And notice that T was in these blocks. T is the transaction that the attacker used to fund the deposit to Coinbase. There is now no longer a transaction funding the, the, the attacker's Coinbase account in the blockchain anymore. But the Bitcoin, the BTC, has already been withdrawn. This would be an example of a successful 51% attack if this were to occur. The ability to do this is directly related to how difficult it is for an attacker to overpower the network. The more work being put into solving the proof of work puzzles on the network, the more difficult it will be to overwhelm the network. Note also that the danger of this attack comes when you accept a deposit directly from the attacker. In this example, Bitcoin was provided in exchange for MUH. The attacker, if the attacker can't get something irrevocable in exchange for the vulnerable coin, this attack is inviolable. This is one of the reasons that an exchange is such a good target for this attack, liquidity. 51% attacks are easy to spot if you're watching. One, each block, is, um, each block is identified by its hash, which provides a unique fingerprint to the block. Two, observing hash changes will help you detect reorgs. If the hash of some block at height n changes from what it was before, there must have been some kind of reorg. Small reorgs are normal. 
They happen on a regular basis, primarily driven by the fact that many nodes are attempting to find blocks, and there is some amount of latency within the network. So multiple blocks can be found simultaneously, and eventually only one will be in the blockchain. Any reorg deeper than the confirmation limit of a recipient will allow for the possibility of a successful 51% attack. You can examine the hash of the blocks at heights n minus 1, n minus 2, etc., and get a sense of how deep or severe a reorg was. You can expect, inspect the contents of a block to look for the presence of T and T prime. You would, rather, you would, you would inspect the contents of all the blocks involved in the reorg. That's the smoking gun that a reorg is malicious. Money that was sent to one place originally is effectively clawed back by the appearance of the new blocks and the reorg. Recently, Ethereum Classic, a cryptocurrency, was successfully 51% attacked. Because this is an asset Coinbase supports, we had monitoring systems in place which alerted in real time to the attack, allowing Coinbase to pause interaction with the ETC blockchain. I'll talk about how this attack unfolded. The ETC network is minding its own business, mining blocks as usual, adding transactions to the blockchain. Blocks continue to get produced as the cryptographic puzzle continues to be solved. Bam, all of a sudden, seven new blocks show up out of nowhere. And these seven blocks don't extend from the most recent block, but dig down five blocks back, orphaning four blocks. 12 hours later, it happens again. Six new blocks show up this time, orphaning five previously found blocks. I'm calling both of these incidents practice attacks because neither of them contained a pair of transactions T and T prime, which is the smoking gun that an attack is underway. These are just reorgs. However, we had never observed reorgs of this depth on ETC, even though it would have been premature to label these as attacks on their own since there were no double spends, it still got our attention. Then three hours after the second practice attack, there was another reorg. This time, 74 new blocks showed up all at once, orphaning 57 blocks. And within those blocks, we observed a T and a T prime, as shown here. This happened on a Saturday night. Our on-call engineers responded, validated this alert, and paused our interaction with the ETC blockchain. It's important to realize that pausing interaction with the blockchain is sufficient to protect you from this attack, because the attack requires that you credit a deposit that happened on the chain. Twelve additional attacks happened after we had paused interaction with the ETC blockchain. Larger amounts of ETC were stolen in each of the attacks. The total amount was over $1.1 million. We estimate the cost at no more than $250,000. It, it was much more likely that it was closer to $50,000. Several exchanges later identified themselves as victims of the attack. And we posted a blog post with more details about it on the Coinbase blog if you're interested in learning more. Now we're going to move on to ERC-20 administrative privilege takeover. Smart contract, ERC-20s are a type of smart contract, and you can think of a smart contract as a protocol of it in and of itself. It sets up a system with rules, interfaces, and interaction logic. Smart contracts are arbitrary code deployed on a blockchain. Most tracks state within whatever system they establish. ERC-20 is a smart co contract standard to create a token. This means that an ERC-20 token tracks balances and allows for sending and receiving of coins. Many ERC-20 contracts have super user privileges. That means there is one or more administrator roles that exercise control over core functioning of the contract. We'll dive into an example of this. Here are two snippets of code from a smart contract. They are both what are known as modifiers, which must evaluate to true before a function can be executed. On the left, we see that the sender of the transaction must be equal to whatever the owner function returns. On the right, we can see that the value of the Boolean variable paused must be set to false. Now we have a function, pause, that has both of these two modifiers. As you can see, this means that only the owner can call pause, and only if the Boolean variable pause is false. The pause function will flip that Boolean to true. Now we have the function transfer, a fundamental ability of any type of token system. Notice it, how it has the modifier, when not paused. Meaning, if the Boolean paused is set to true, no one can transfer anything. So we can see how there's the ability for whoever is the owner to entirely shut down all the transfer functionality for this token. 
Subversion of an ERC-20 contract can be accomplished if control over these super user privileges is gained by an attacker. I want to take a second to clarify, this is a very different type of protocol subversion than a 51% attack. For 51% attacks, the protocol is the blockchain itself and how things are appended to it. For, um, thus, a 51% attack is a blockchain level integrity violation. In the case of ERC-20s, the blockchain is functioning entirely as it's designed, but the integrity of the smart contract system is under attack. Subversion of the smart contract is the act of including a transaction in the blockchain that causes integrity failures of the original system. I just gave an example of the pause super user power, but some super user privileges provide nearly unlimited authority over the smart contract system. This might sound like a crazy thing to add to your smart contract. I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for why such authority exists. Smart contracts are meant to be immutable. Building software is an iterative process. This is a fairly fundamental issue for smart contracts to grapple with. How do we resolve this? Introducing the proxy structure. It's a smart contract that works according to the following setup. One, attempt to use your own internal logic to execute incoming transactions and change state. If you can't do that, fall back on a contract that is specified in some variable that you hold. This fallback contract can have all the logic of a system. In the case of a token where you have a transfer and get balance function, all that the proxy needs to do is maintain the pointer to the token contract along with the authorization configuration required to update that pointer. If you want to update the system because you may have decided the transfer and get balance don't provide enough functionality, you can deploy some other contract that has additional token functionality included in it, such as pause and mint. The proxy contract still points to the old token contract but it maintains the authorization functionality to change this pointer. We can see here a function, upgrade to, if admin is a modifier, and if that's true, this function can be called and specify a new token contract. If admin calls upgrade to, we have now upgraded our system to use the logic in the dead beef contract on the right, not the center contract, without changing anything except for a variable in the proxy contract. Integrations with the proxy aren't disrupted, so our customers aren't disrupted by this upgrade. However, you can see here that the variable holding that contract address with the tokens logic is extremely important. And I'm sure most of you can see where this is going. It sure would be a bad thing if a malicious actor could set this variable. If there were some way to update the proxy to point to the bad contract, attackers would have the full functionality of the bad contract at their disposal. In this threat model, the attacker could choose which contract the proxy relies on so we can assume that the attacker would have written and deployed whatever code was necessary to execute this attack. In this case, perhaps the attacker maintains all the properties of the existing token system, but with the single difference that the attacker can invoke drain balance, which perhaps allows the attacker to steal anyone's tokens. This completely breaks the protocol defined by the original deployed smart contract, allowing the attacker arbitrary control over the system. Coinbase contracts have been probed in this way. We can monitor for these similarly to how we monitor for 51% attacks, by parsing the state of the blockchain and observing whether any of the criteria we've defined as subversive or dangerous has occurred. Two transactions probe the USDC ERC-20 contract on Saturday. USDC is a stable coin that Coinbase operates. These contracts attempted to take administrative control over the proxy contract. These transactions both failed when they were evaluated by the Ethereum virtual machine because they didn't have the proper authorization to make these updates. This means they didn't result in any state changes to the USDC smart contract. However, if these invocations hadn't failed, the entire nature of the USDC smart contract system could have changed. These were the two functions that were attempted to be called and eva evaluated as failed transactions. Change admin, which would change the owner role from the previous example, who can specify the proxy contract, and upgrade to actually changing the proxy. Realize this attack can only work if the administrator of the proxy contract has lost the keys to the contract, or if there's a failure in the proxy contract that allows a non-administrator to take administrative actions. Coinbase takes this responsibility very seriously and has strong controls over the keys and reviews the code very carefully in order to guard against it. This type of probing is normal and to be expected, and this isn't the first time we've observed this. There was a smart contract system where attackers were able to successfully abuse administrative privileges. 
for a kick coin. Here's the super user privilege that allows the owner to mint tokens to any arbitrary address. Here's the super user privilege that allows the owner to destroy tokens at any address. The owner keys were compromised, and the attacker called destroy and mint many times, effectively causing a transfer from any address to an attacker address without changing the overall supply of kick. My slides will be available, so here are some sources for anyone who wants to look more closely. The point here is that we can clearly see that as was the case with 51% attacks, actors exist that are capable of successfully executing these attacks. So to recap, I defined protocol subversion as integrity violations of the underlying systems, and I talked about the threat model unique to exchanges. I discussed 51% devil spend attacks with an example of one in the wild with Ethereum Classic. I discussed ERC-20 administrative privilege takeover with an example of one in the wild with Kitcoin. Does anyone have any questions? There's a microphone if you have questions, and we can bring it to you. There's a question here. Hi, do you monitor like the risk of a specific coin to be like hijacked by a 51% attack? So like for example, there's a higher risk for Ethereum Classic than for Bitcoin. Correct. Is that something that you track? Absolutely. Yep. Question there? So to my knowledge, it seems like Coinbase is planning on adding more and more assets. Um, how do you actually scale how you're actually kind of monitoring all these assets and looking to different unique risks that they face? Right, we have to have a system that will allow us to do that based on, based on some rules-based system that we can monitor and determine the risk, as you pointed out, of each individual coin. Um, and, and we have invested the time and effort to build the tools that can do that so that we can properly support Coinbase's ambition to support more and more tokens on the platform. Two questions related. One of them is, is there any such thing as a privilege escalation attack in which someone manages to gain administrative privileges or something equivalent or equivalent access, but without using the key of the admin account to get there? And the follow-up question is, have there been any implementations in smart contracts of a permissions model that has more than two levels? Okay, for your first question, um, yes, you don't need to use, there, there's, there's more than one way to get administrative controls. There are, there are basically two ways. One is to hack the administrator and masquerade as the administrator. That's the example where you steal the private keys. The other is simply if there's an authorization logic failure in the contract. Some of these contracts can be complicated and it's quite possible that the code written doesn't check they make the proper authorization checks in all cases, in which case maybe an administrative action would be exposed to a user in that way. Not necessarily. It, it, I see, yeah, it's, it wouldn't be like a privilege escalation vulnerability within Linux or something like that, but it, would, it, it, it completely depends. It's gonna be very specific to the authorization model within that smart contract, and so it depends on the nature of the bug. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I would be pretty surprised if there weren't any. Um, you had a second question? Yeah, yeah, there have been, so the Could question you... to, to repeat for anyone who couldn't hear because of the mic, um, have there been other authorization models other than just privileged and non-privileged. And yes, there have been. There are different smart contracts that provide different roles for almost anything you could imagine. So you could have a pauser role. Instead of owner, you could have owner, pauser, minter, any of these, um, any of, any of these roles that, that you just define as, as an author of the smart contract, and you can write a modifier that checks that, and then you apply it to whatever functions you want those authorizations to be scoped to. Probably time for one more question. Are there like public repositories of vulnerabilities associated to these different block, uh, code, code bases? 
Um, yeah, vulnerabilities are cataloged. Um, I'm not sure if I can think of a best place to recommend where they would be cataloged off the top of my head. Um, but a lot of times when these vulnerabilities are discovered, because smart contracts are immutable, the contract may have to be redeployed, and the entire system may have to upgrade to the new deployed contract. So it is actually um, a serious issue when something like this happens. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate your, att your attention.